Now, it's interesting that this webinar is on this day because this day is about balance. The equinoxes are a perfect balance of daytime and nighttime. And that's really what the rights of nature is about. We, Shannon and I have been part of this movement for many, many years from the very beginning in around 2008. And we started movement rights in uh, 2014 to align human law with the natural laws of our beautiful mother earth. When we started, it was very interesting to explain this concept to other people who weren't plugged into um, indigenous ways of thinking, to the original instructions of indigenous people, to the thought and the idea of how we live in balance and harmony within the laws of the planet that we live on. And we can see, especially this year, how those laws are so out of balance that we, humanity has really violated the laws of our beautiful mother earth. And, um, you know, here in California, we have the fires and other places there's tornadoes and storms and uh, hurricanes and so on. And so since Shannon and I have been doing this for quite a while now, uh, Shannon Biggs and I, we're, we're really excited that this whole movement is taking root, not only on Turtle Island here in North America, but around the world. Um, it's, it, if you look at the map on the Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature, that shows where people are working on recognizing the rights of Mother Earth, where people have already passed laws to recognize the rights of Mother Earth, to recognize rivers and um, ecosystems. It's really an exciting and powerful movement to be part of. Um, as I said, my name is Penny, Penny Opal Plant. I'm talking to you from the San Francisco East Bay, where my family has been for uh, many years since the 1930s. I live on occupied Ohlone territory, and I see the Chevron refinery every day from my home. So the fossil fuel industry that's causing a lot of these harms is front and center, right where we are. Um, one of the programs of I Don't Know More is the, we call them the Iron Forums. They are intertribal rights of nature forums for indigenous people and leaders and uh, tribal officials to meet together to look at how we can all work together in recognizing the rights of nature and tribal law in, you know, sometimes starting with resolutions, but really getting this all off the ground. Because if, if we don't do this, I'm not sure we're all going to make it. And, you know, we would be taking all of our non-human relatives with us, which is just too heartbreaking to really consider. So I'm excited to be uh, welcoming all of you here. And uh, our good friend, Dion Ben, from the, uh, he's the Native American Program Manager for the Grand Canyon Trust is going to lead us in an opening prayer. Thank you so much, Dion. Good morning, Penny, Shannon, panels, and audience. Thanks for joining in. My name is Dion Ben. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and just start off with an opening prayer um, to, to begin this conversation and begin this space. Um, and then I'll introduce myself further on when I get into uh, my time to speak. So I'm, gonna, uh, I'm Navajo, I'm from the Navajo Nation. I'm from Tohatchi, New Mexico, and I'm gonna start off my prayer in Navajo uh, as we are, and then um, go on uh, finishing off in Navajo. So let's all take this time and reflect on our blessings and reflect on our, our plans moving forward and such, so. Creator, I ask you to bless us today on this special day to give us guidance and to give us protection and to give us understanding. Creator, I ask 
I thank you for all the wonderful blessings that you have given us. I thank you for all the wonderful blessings of health, understanding, and guidance. And I thank you for the life that you've given to every one of us, from the smallest creatures to the largest, to us humankind, to the environment and to the air we breathe. That life continues to cycle from our ancestors to our children, to our great-great-grandchildren, to the generations ahead. I thank you. I ask you to continue to bless us this day and the days coming, to give us understanding and to give us patience. I ask you to guide us through this work and I ask you to guide this work so that it'll proceed forward in a forward moving motion for folks to understand and for folks to, to be guided by this work, however it may be perceived, I ask you to give us the understanding and to give us the work and the initiative and the ethics behind our efforts to move this work forward. I also ask a special blessing today for all humankind throughout the world to give us strength to understand forward. I also ask all of our children, wherever they are at, all of our elders, wherever they are at, all of our veterans, I ask you to bless them for further, for further and for future health and understanding and patience. I also ask you to bless all of the species throughout the world and our Mother Earth and our Father Sky so that they would continue to move forward in providing for themselves and for providing for life and our life ways as species as we coexist. I ask you to Bless all of the people across the world who are impacted by this virus to give them the strength to combat and to fight this virus and give us all an understanding to move forward. I also ask you, Creator, to bless all the families who have been impacted by this virus, to give them a comfort of understanding and a comfort of healing. And I also ask you, Creator, to bless our leadership so that they will be able to make decisions on behalf of the people, on behalf of the environment, on behalf of life and our lives moving forward. Give them the guidance to understand and to be patient and to react with intent rather than react with emotion. I ask you, Creator, to bless this. All of us here on this webinar and across the world, as we listen to this prayer to give us the comfort that we need, Heavenly Father, our Mother Earth, our Father Sky. But ah, e kwani hichin sa hatil zindo le sa kwande. Kado zesti ko da sinilo kwani bi kahit ine kwante nani tini hut ah e sa hatil zindo be shifal zindo hut ah e ni hichin na us kado hut ah e ni hichin sa hatil zindo le sa tishjingi. Ha aden shat a e a na kons ni sni ya sni da from all directions. May we live in balance and understanding and peace and a forward moving motion for all life. But a e ben hich it saw the zindo le so. Be hojana ha sleet ni son ko. But a e ben nas dot ni ni jo na ni kato le so. Hojana ha sleet, hojana ha sleet, hojana ha sleet, hojana ha sleet. May they be beauty restored and may there be beauty continuous. Thank you. Thank you, Dion. Um, Penny, do you, you shall I go? Uh, I just wanted to, my name is Shannon Biggs. I'm co-founder of Movement Rights along with Penny Opal Plant. And um, I'm going to be, uh, I'm, I'm not a speaker, but I will be introducing the speakers um, with a little bio. I hope uh, they will introduce themselves uh, further as appropriate. Uh, and I will be also managing the questions. You'll notice at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's a little Q&A box. If you have questions for the panelists, please put them there. Some questions will be answered, just we'll type the answers that everyone can see the questions and the answers. Um, but most questions for the panelists, we will uh, 
we will address after all of the um, all of the speakers have given their opening remarks. I want to thank Dion for that beautiful opening prayer and starting us off in such a good way. I want to thank our uh, amazing panelists. You may notice that you don't see Casey Camp Hornick on our screen yet. She is on uh, uh, another, she'll be joining us in a few minutes. She's wrapping up another um, uh, Indigenous panel with another organization, our friends at the Women's Earth and Climate Action Network on um, Indigenous-led strategies for divestment from fossil fuels. So um, that'll also be shared on Weekend's page later. But uh, so we expect her to be joining us momentarily. So thank you all for being here. We had an overwhelming response. So for those of you who made it into the Zoom room, I'm very glad, we're, we're all very glad to have you here. Uh, and um, uh, there, we are also broadcasting live on Movement Rights um, Facebook page. And anybody of course can share that page uh, as well um, so that others, uh, can can join in the conversation. And uh, without further delay, we'll just get right into it. I'd like to uh, introduce Dion Ben He's Navajo. He is the director of the Native American program for the Grand Canyon Trust. He's working with many tribes on the Colorado Plateau on the rights of nature. He's trained in both traditional native ways and contemporary environmental sciences and has long worked to incorporate traditional ecological knowledge to animal husbandry and grazing management from within tribal communities facing climate change. And uh, he's also been a lead advisor on a volunteer project that um, a number of, of organizations, including Movement Rights, have been working on to make sure that uh, tribal uh, communities have access to PPE, masks, and other protective equipment during COVID. And uh, with that, Dion, of course, please correct anything I have said that isn't uh, quite right uh, or, or tell us more about yourself. But we're interested if you could tell us about the rights of nature from the Navajo indigenous perspective and discuss your work with tribes on the Colorado Plateau. Uh, Dion? Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Penny. Thank you, Movement Rights, for putting this together. I'm super excited to be able to virtually share with you all um, some updates on what we've been working on on the Colorado Plateau with the tribes, as well as I'm excited to virtually interact with folks. Um, I've been uh, living here in uh, Tohatchi, New Mexico, since March. Um, I've been self-sheltering here with my family. And I'm just really excited to have this virtual interaction with folks um, in a safe way, talking about really strong, innovative, and historical ancient knowledge. So it's just a wonderful day to, to share with everybody. So good morning, or good afternoon from New Mexico. Uh, I'm gonna introduce myself in Navajo first and I'll give you a little bit of background of who I am, um, aside from what Shannon had, uh, in addition to what Shannon had mentioned. So, uh, <laughs> My name is Dion Ben. I'm originally from Tohatchi, New Mexico, where I am right now, um, alongside with my family here in Tohatchi, taking care of the ranch, taking care of responsibilities, making sure everybody is healthy and safe here in Tohatchi with my family. Um, I'm I live in Flagstaff, Arizona as well. There is where I work and um, there's where I spend most of my time thinking about uh, the movements of work going forward um, at the base of our sacred mound, the San Francisco Peaks. And I work there for an organization called the Grand Canyon Trust. I've been there for nearly 10 years. 
And uh, we are a local nonprofit organization that focuses on, we, we work on advocacy for conservation and for the landscapes throughout the Colorado Plateau. And so I'm the Native America program director there. And I have a number of colleagues that are just stretched out across the Colorado Plateau working with indigenous communities, working with indigenous nations, and working with small communities and large scale policy actions going forward, whether it's with the park service or the forest services or other uh, federal agencies. So I'm really excited to be part of that team and really excited to share with you all the work that we've been doing around the rights of nature on the Colorado Plateau. So in that way, I greet you. I am originally, uh, well, originally from Tohatchi, but I am of the uh, Minnehogan people clan. I am born for the Salt People clan and my paternal grandparents are the Red House People clan and my maternal grandparents are the Weaver people. So in this way, I introduce myself and say hello to all of uh, the folks who are able to understand me. Um, I'll just jump right into some of the work that we've been doing in regards to how we've been moving a rights of nature uh, directive and initiative on the Colorado Plateau. So about 10 years ago, uh, our organization was able to organize a conversation group. This conversation group is made up of about 20 people plus and about 10 tribes and growing. Um, right now, we are celebrating our 10th year. Uh, we have over 12 tribes participating, tribes that are located throughout the Colorado Plateau. Uh, we have over 25 participants that participate in this conversation. We gather once a year. Sometimes we gather in subcommittees twice a year, three times a year, based off of the need uh, happening in, in Indian country. And so, uh, we are the basic of our the basis of our conversations are based on health, water, sacred sites, and language and culture, and these three pillars are um, interwoven to cover a lot of the um, topics and a lot of the conversations happening throughout the Colorado Plateau within tribal communities, and so from this group uh, we started discussing um, how we would work collectively beyond just a, um, a policy um, management or policy directive. And we started uh, beginning to look at innovative approaches that are happening throughout the country. And from there, we were able to uh, find partners and really dissect and, 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 and investigate some of the new um, things that are happening across the country and across the world. And it was through them that we were able to find out about the rights of nature. At that time, it was more of a national, or it was at that time it was more of an international um, initiative. Um, we were able to really understand the dynamics of the rights of nature from a lot of the Ecuador cases, a lot of the New Zealand uh, initiatives and across the, across the, 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 um, the globe. And so from that point forward, uh, we started building up our foundations as our group. We are called the Colorado Plateau Intertribal Conversations Group, CPIC. And through them, we have members that are sitting on a subcommittee right now of a Rights of Nature subcommittee. We discuss um, how the Rights of Nature initiative would be introduced or how it would be framed or how the foundations of the rights of nature would begin on the Colorado Plateau, one of the places in the nation that has a large, rich culture of diverse tribes, diverse backgrounds, and diverse stories, and diverse understandings of where we are at and where we need to go. And so we started having conversations about how we would uh, move forward with the rights of nature. At the beginning, when we started our conversations, uh, we were being, we were being educated on what the rights of nature was in a political uh, um, position. We were, dis we were being educated on how uh, rights of nature is placed in the policy arena with that, at, at, at a national level, at a state level, or even within a tribal level, um, looking at tribal policies, looking at state policies, and national federal policies. So from that point, we took a step back as a group and we started looking at the foundations of what the rights of nature is. And that's where we've been, um, that's where we've been sitting for the past year and a half before um, COVID hit. We were 
on the break of presenting some of our foundational themes, our foundational principles uh, to, the, to the tribes across the Colorado Plateau. And so we put that on hold um, until it is safe to gather again, until it is safe to meet. But what our intent is, is to go forward across the Colorado Plateau and, and give the information to tribal members, to give the information of what the rights of nature is at a national level, at a local level, and at a tribal level. And I give them the foundations of what we already all know as tribal members across the Colorado Plateau. And so um, we're looking to move that forward within next year um, as we start planning for 2021 and how that looks with uh, current situations of safety concerns and whatnot. So what we are presenting to the communities is the foundations of what the rights of nature is. For us on the Colorado Plateau with the tribes that we work with, the 10 tribes plus 12 tribes, um, what we are looking at is framing the rights of nature from an indigenous principle, foundation, and background. So from our perspective, when we look at the, when we look at the rights of nature, there's so many parallel concepts that line, in, that line up with where we are in this people, with our thinking in respects to the environment as our mother, the provides life, and all of the species and, 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 and surrounding life, and so that's what we are looking at as uh, the Colorado Plateau tribes. We are looking at defining what those principles are and reconstructing opportunities for humankind to understand where we need to go to redefine those relationships and where we need to go to change our policies to, to really um, create a new level or new paradigm of understanding our relationship to uh, ecosystems, to understand our relationships to one another, to provide livelihood for, for all life. So that's where we are at with our work on the, on the Colorado Plateau with the tribes. Um, one of the things that we are really focusing in on is the principles of um, going beyond utilizing uh, this rights of nature campaign or this rights of nature initiative to go beyond just a protection policy. We're looking to utilize the rights of nature as a mechanism or as a theme to help humankind understand or re-understand our relationship with the environment, with the livelihood that um, that environment supports. So for instance, Many of the examples of the rights of nature cases that exist today um, are a river. And so we want to go, if we use that as an example, the tribes on the Colorado Plateau want to go beyond just protecting a river and protecting a river in a policy avenue that um, protects it from illegal dumping, from contamination, from blocking the river, things like that. We want to go beyond that protection policy to really re-examine how this policy of, of protecting the river for the livelihood and interaction and interactive relationship we have with that river um, as humankind, as species um, contributing to our component of the river and the river contributing back to the livelihood of the moss that grows there, the livelihoods of all species downstream, upstream, and, 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 and in those situations. So that's what we're focusing in on, um, is using our principles as indigenous uh, peoples to really build that foundation to really change the, the, the mindset and the paradigm of what this policy could be, uh, what it could bring beyond just a protection uh, effort. We want to look at it as the practicality of, of, of a rights of nature case. Um, whether we identify a, a spring, a river, a landscape, we want to understand the practicality and the interaction that that lifestyle has or that livelihood has with that with that um, river ecosystem, spring or, or or species. And we also want to look at the the relationship of interaction. Um, and so we, as, as tribal um, folks that are gathering, we've really dived into the basics of who we are. 
we're looking at color associations. We're looking at the colors of white, yellow, blue, black, and red, and how that associates with our perception and the perspectives of our in, of our ecosystem and, and our environment. Um, so that that that's just a, a a small glimpse of what we've been looking forward to and what we've been talking about um, going forward. And one of the things also, just as a closing remark right now for uh, for this presentation, would be one of the things that we are really um, keeping at, at, as, as a headline for us is that when we talk about the rights of nature, we're not quantifying the rights of individual species, of ecosystems. We're looking at the rights of everything, of the right to live and the right to flourish for, for today and for the future. And so we're not looking at breaking down the rights for a river, the rights for people, the rights for individuals, the rights for species. It's an overarching policy that we're looking at for the rights of livelihood for the entire system. Um, and that's what we're really keeping as a forefront for our, as we build up a rights of nature uh, initiative. Right now, there's no rights of nature case on the Colorado Plateau, only because we are making sure that um, all aspects of the rights of nature are, are looked at and the foundation is strong to build up on going forward. So that's what I'll share for now. And I'll be happy to uh, listen to the rest of the team that I have here on panel and then also some of the questions uh, going forward. So thank you. Thank you, Dion. Um, Penny and I were have been lucky, fortunate enough to uh, work with to, to participate in some of the events that Dion has put together for the uh, for the communities on the Colorado Plateau and just so inspired and grateful for the the years of connection and work um, that we've uh, been able to share with each other so thank you Dion for that really inspiring um, update on the important work that you're doing. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Kelsey Leonard. Kelsey sits on the Mid-Atlantic Regional Planning Body consisting of tribal, federal, and state entities. She's charged with, that is charged with guiding the protection, the maintenance, and the restoration of America's oceans and coasts. As a Shinnecock citizen and environmental leader, she strives to be a strong advocate for the protection of indigenous waters through enhanced interjurisdictional coordination and meaningful consultation. She's been instrumental in protecting the interests of tribes with the development of the Mid-Atlantic Ocean Action Plan and building a sustainable ocean future by valuing, by valuing indigenous traditional ecological knowledge. Um, I've not had the pleasure of meeting Kelsey in person, but I've watched her TED Talks and read uh, her articles. They're so inspiring and we're so grateful to have her join us here. Kelsey, can you please share with us the, the rights of nature and the connection with indigenous water rights? Thank you. So akwe, wanikasat, hello and welcome everyone. I hope you're having a great day. I am so excited to, to be here with you virtually. I am currently an assistant professor at the Faculty of Environment at the University of Waterloo in Ontario, Canada. So I'm actually speaking to you today from sort of Southern Ontario and uh, on the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabek. So it's really uh, a pleasure for me to be uh, a visitor in, in the Great Lakes, being from a coastal Algonquin indigenous nation and Shinnecock, our territory is located on the Eastern Southern shores of Long Island um, in what's currently known as New York. So. I have a very innate uh, and inherent connection to water being a, a, a coastal uh, indigenous person and then also now living in the Great Lakes and a lot of my science and, and research focuses on our connection as indigenous peoples to water, but in particular the way in which we are advocating for the water as water protectors and sometimes the disconnect that exists between non-Indigenous communities and how they think about water and then how we think about water. Now, as Indigenous peoples, we have, you know, thousands of nations just within, you know, here in North America and Turtle Island and thousands more around the world. So 
I don't want to say necessarily that all of our viewpoints are a monolith. We have different ways in which we understand our connection to water. And that connection is supposed to be very local. It's supposed to be about the water that's closest to you, that you form that relationship with, that kinship with. And But the one thing that I will say is that in the same way that we form a connection to water, although it might be diverse and unique and individual to each of us and our indigenous communities, the water connects us all. Um, you know, through throughout the hydrologic cycle, we are all connected by water. And I think that that's something that we can actually learn a lot from when we're starting to think through these big water challenges of, of our future generations um, and really trying to think about what legacy do we leave for, for, for those future generations? And so if I take a step back, I really appreciated what, what Dion then said about the challenges and the, the policy implications that they're thinking through in, in the Colorado Plateau um, and for the tribal nations there. I think, you know, if we, if we take a step back and, and also post here um, into the, the chat box, some folks have mentioned my TED talk where on a little bit of a, of a time limit. We can't spend hours upon hours with everyone today, even though we'd love to. Um, I've, I'll post it there so you can kind of get a, a greater insight into some of the advocacy and thinking that I have around how we restore connection to water and how we advocate for greater protections for water around the world. But if we take a step back to some of the, the challenges that Dion pointed out about you know, how non-Indigenous people view water and how we as Indigenous people view water, I often start with one question. When we think about how do we make decisions, how do we make laws, how do we think about the way in which we relate to the natural world, we often ask ourselves or should be asking our, well, or the non-Indigenous folks often ask, what is water? Like, what is the thing that we're talking about? And you have a chat box available to you. And if you'd like, you can type into the chat box your answers to that. But commonly, the answers that I will get are, well, water is H2O. Water is um, you know, a, an element of our planet. Water is a river or a lake or the ocean. Water is uh, our, you know, our, our ice caps. It you know, manifests in all of these different ways. And yes, that, that's true. And sometimes, I'll, I'll get a few folks that say, yes, water is life, you know, that that essentiality of our existence on this planet. But what if we started to think about the question a little differently? What if instead we weren't asking what is water, but who is water? In the same way that you might ask or someone might ask you about who is your grandmother, who is your auntie, who is your sister? If you start to think about that, then you might actually start to ascribe characteristics, personality to the water. It, you start to describe it in the way in which you have a relationship, the way in which you've established connection. That is fundamentally important for the differences that exist in how we govern water globally around the world. We're often not asking the right questions is what I'm trying to say. We're often situated, um, and predominantly the non-Indigenous world, is situated in asking the question, what is water? What is the water that we need to make a law for? What is water that we need to protect? And they'll say, okay, well, it's this lake, or it's this groundwater aquifer, or it's you know, this other uh, water body that we're interested in. And that only gives us a finite amount of solutions and practices and ways in which we can actually address the problem or address the concern that that water body is facing. Where if we actually fundamentally transitioned to more of an indigenous worldview, where we're asking about who is that water, having more holistic understanding of the way in which that water supports an entire ecosystem, is in relation with an entire ecosystem, that changes the types of solutions, the types of governance practices, the types of laws that we create to protect the water body and to protect the water as a whole. And so that's the type of fundamental transformation that I am advocating for and looking for, you know, where are the best practices around the world, uh, both from indigenous and non-indigenous perspectives. And I think that's where we're starting to see a lot of, uh, you know, emergence of the rights of nature movement translating to, in particularly to water. So we have uh, the granting of legal personhood to, um, 
the Fanganui River in Aotearoa, New Zealand. We've had the uh, attempts at, at legal personhood granting for uh, the Ganges, um, although somewhat being debated in the court system there. We've had a granting of legal personhood for Lake Erie here in the Great Lakes by the city of Toledo, and really a grassroots environmental movement. But again, what we start to see, especially with water, when it's shared across jurisdictions and across communities and different peoples with different worldviews, is it becomes contested as to whether or not that grant of legal personhood is, is allowable. And I think why it's contested is not necessarily this, this, people are challenging it based on whether or not you have the authority to make that grant. But I think they're only challenging it because there's still a lack of education, a lack of understanding about what the rights of nature actually mean and what it can do in terms of water protection for our current communities and societies as well as for future generations. And I think you know one of the key areas that rights of nature and the granting of legal personhood for water has for you know for us right now is a way to modernize our existing legal frameworks to address the climate crisis and really to address the multiple water crises we see um, happening not only within the United States and Canada but around the world. And you're probably asking yourself, okay, what does that what does that mean in practice? What does she mean by modernize our existing things so that we have this ability to address these you know massive challenges facing our communities right now? Well, let's take one one example. The Clean Water Act right now isn't really modernized. And for a lot of tribal nations in the United States, we might be applying for treatment in the same manner as a state to develop water quality standards that get approved through the Environmental Protection Agency. And then we're able to sort of administer our own water quality standards to protect water bodies that flow through our reservations and, and indigenous territories. Well, those standards and, and those, those um, amendments to the Clean Water Act were done in the 1980s. So it really hasn't been modernized to include anything around climate change, to adapt to the climate crisis. And then even still, the water quality standards that sometimes we're able to establish as tribal nations are very you know, biophysical. We're not thinking in a holistic manner. Sometimes we've been able to add things around cultural and ceremonial protections of water um, through the water quality standards, but it's, it's very limited and it's not giving us the full opportunity to mobilize our indigenous legal systems into a modern framework. And that's where I think through the granting of legal personhood through our own legal systems, through our own judiciaries, really gives us a much broader opportunity as indigenous nations and tribal nations to say, here is how we should be protecting the water from a holistic viewpoint so that it can exist, flourish, and naturally evolve for future generations. And so that we're not only limiting ourselves to protections based on the biophysical integrity of water, but to the protection of that connection and relationship to water. So I think I'll pause there because you're gonna hear so much more from actual folks on the ground doing this work. And then I'd be happy to jump in later for questions. So Vudi, thank you. Thank you, Kelsey. That um, I think the minute you said, who is water? Um, reminded me and I think probably Dion, Penny, and Casey of the um, the delegation that we took to Aotearoa uh, to meet with uh, the Wanganui and Te Uruera and other tribes to learn and to share knowledge about um, uh, uh, about this work. And of course, one of the things that you do there is also introduce yourself um, not by your credentials and, you know, I've done this and I've done that, but who you're, who, who are your, who's your, who, the mountain that you're from, the water that you're from, and then your ancestors before you, you know, even begin to really talk about, um, you know, the things that we've done and that we're working on. And uh, it really does shift the dynamic of the conversation. And I'm really grateful for the work that you're doing and um, looking forward to uh, the questions that I know people have for you. Next, I'd like to introduce Julian Matthews. Um, hello, Julian. We, uh, Julian is an enrolled member of the Nez Pierce. He's been involved in environmental issues for many years from the Megalodes protest to stop the Alberta tar sands equipment going through 
uh, their territory to dam breaching, free the, free the snake flotillas that have been held to push dam removal on the Snake River. The group he helped co-found, uh, I hope that I'm correct, uh, pronouncing it correctly, Nimipu, Protect the Environment, which pushed put forward the idea of recognizing rights on the Snake River, among many other activities. He served six years in the Navy, received a bachelor's in business from Gonzaga University and a master's in public administration from the University of Idaho. Julian, um, so honored to have you join us here. Uh, please discuss the rights of the Snake River, why it is important to the Nez Pierce people. And I understand also from some of your writings that there is a connection between the rights of the snake and uh, poverty alleviation uh, among your tribes. So we welcome you. Thank you for being here and um, please share with us. Thank you. Okay, um, thanks a lot. And I appreciate Kelsey and Dion and the others, uh, um, Penny, for the words they've spoken. Um, <clears throat> like she said, my name is Julian Matthews and actually we're Nimipu, the people in our, Nimipu attempt in our language, Nimipu means the people. Nez Perce was a misnomer when the French traders come here, they saw some Chinook Indians that had pierced noses. And so I don't know if they named us that for that purpose or what, but it's like I tell people, I've never seen any of my ancestors with pierced noses. So, so I don't know where they got that name, but I do have a couple of slides I'd like to just show about where we're located and kind of some of the ideas that we have. Is that okay? Absolutely. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see where it says share screen and you can share your screen. Okay, so um, what happened with us was we first started, um, uh, well, maybe I'll go through some of the other stuff here actually. <clears throat> okay, the Snake River, if you don't know where it's at, we're in uh, Pacific Northwest and the Snake River runs off of um, the Columbia, which flows into the Pacific Ocean, then uh, makes its way up here to Snake, the Salmon, the Clearwater, the Loxaw Selway areas up in our um, area, treaty area, original 1855 treaty area, the Mimi Fluor Nest person. Uh, so we have, um, it's, it's, it's a pretty major river and there's always been all sorts of um, species of salmon that spawn up in the, they call it the Selway Loxa area up on the Snake and the Salmon. And, and so, um, what has happened over the years is there's been a, a number of dams uh, put in and in the late 19 or in the early, uh, 19, around 60, 70, they put in a number of dams on the Snake River and they call them the Lower Snake River Dams because it's down from down river from the main stem. So, so these are just some um, some information on where the Snake River begins and, and where it flows. And it's just, it's a really a long river. It's a major river and it's um, provided salmon for us in travel. Um, if you see our website, we just did the first dug up canoe on a reservation 110 years with kids. And so that was one thing we're using as a way to impact the rivers, not being able to use canoes to flow up and down the river like we used to do, whether it's for fishing, hunting, visiting, socializing, or going down down river and for whatever reason. And so <clears throat> it's a, one of the lar longest rivers in the country. And then there's a number of tributaries, like I was saying, the Clearwater. And then if you go up um, in Idaho, within our treaty of 1855 area, the Nez Perce, we have the second largest roadless and wilderness area in the United States, except for Alaska. And so um, we do have protections there for the forest, the timber, the water, the, um, various four leggings that and the salmon that go up there up spawn or live up there and so that's one thing that has helped us in our battle with uh, primarily the forest service or other federal agencies um, to protect those and we have a lot of other allies friends of the Clearwater that work with us that work on really protecting these areas from the timber cuts whatever they want to do up there they always want to do something or um, to impact that. So that will eventually affect the salmon also for the riparian areas. I'm just gonna run through these. And so some of these, um, like once you see the area that what happens, I'll get into the dam part. There's four lower Snake River dams. So what they do, they created these, they're called, um, they're um, half earthen and half concrete. And so the BPA Bonneville Power Administration was created 
and then they generate electric off these four dams and so that electric is the main and then there's some um, irrigation they use they have four four of them have big reservoirs behind them that are really uh, affect us um, particularly the smolts like say if you have a um, like say a baby salmon that's spawned up on the cell where it locks off they float they're supposed to be able to float down to the ocean not swim or anything just float because the current is supposed to carry them down but what happens now is in the reservoirs they get caught and the water is really hot stays really warm and so they get killed they die basically and even going up the other way we have other um industry like potlatch or clear water paper they dump hot water because use water in the different chemicals they dump that right that's right by where i work at the tribal enterprise in our casino and so we have all these uh, different um, pollutants that are going into the fertilizer. Um, like right now, if you go down there, the algae is bloom is really bad because of the fertilizer. So that affects the oxygen that the fish that are trying to come up or go down have to breathe. And so that's a major issue work with other groups on that. Like, so as mentioned, the uh, Clean Water Act um, and other water protections that possibly could assist in this. But so this is our area. Like if you see the Columbia, and then we have our um, the Snake, and then uh, goes all the way up into Wyoming. Like I was saying, the Snake River and affects other tribes. Showband, other tribes have fishing rights on it. Also, that we're working with them on this issue, not particularly with the rights of rivers, but working with them to coordinate our efforts to protect. And then um, we also have four treaty tribes down in Zone Six. They call it where we retain rights to take salmon. It's right by the dam, and so those are the Umatilla, the Nespers. Yakima and the Warm Springs tribes all have treaty rights and they somehow determine that those four tribes us have rights to fish down there. And so um, this is just kind of the outlay of the, the river and then how it turns into the snake and then shows the dams there. So this is our um, 1855 treaty area and usually in the custom areas of the Nimipu or the Nez Perce. And so we have hunting, fishing, and gathering rights in this whole area. And well, we also have usual and a custom, like the reservation, the land base for the Nez Perce Nimipu was diminished, but, um, and then with the Allotment Act and, you know, all these different things they're trying to do to make the Indians move on off the reservation into the cities and stuff, um, impacting the land base. But we're buying back a lot of land from the, uh, um, it's, and it's kind of interesting, I was telling our tribal council that it's really weird that we're buying back our land, you know, like, how's that work? <laughs> because it's just strange to me. And because we ceded it to the federal government, we didn't give it to them or sell it to them or anything. We ceded this land and then we retained the treaty rights, hunting, fishing and gathering to take our medicines, to take elk, moose, uh, fish for salmon in the river. And so the big issue um, right now we're dealing with is it came out with the um, um, environmental impact statement, a draft, uh, probably about yeah, February, a few months ago. And so that's going to be a big battle too with the tribes, with us, with our group, Nimiku Protecting Environment is because right now they um, say that dam breaching is not an option. And, and like, you'll hear the term breaching, dam breaching is those four lower Snake River dams were designed to be what they call breach. They have an earthen part, half of it, and a half of it is concrete so they can remove the earthen part. And so that's one issue I keep pushing for that is that they could either breach them or remove them, but breaching would be good, very good to me. So, okay, so then on, uh, on the rights of rivers, how we got into it was, um, I, I read some about it, like someone was saying about the, the Maori people and then in, um, I believe Australia and some other, I think the Klamath tribe just recently passed a, a resolution or an action. And so we're working with Earth Law Institute, Grant Wilson in Colorado, and he started talking to us about it. And so we, um, start working on um, passing something through our general membership meetings. We have two uh, tribal general membership meetings a year. And so there's, that's where the majority of the tribal members come and then we vote for council, vote for whatever, and take actions. And so the last general council, we uh, did up a resolution and my cousin, the president of our uh, group, um, Elliot Moffat, he presented it, we voted on it. So we approved this resolution. Uh, for making the Snake River to establish the rights of the Snake River. And so right now um, with the tribal council, I talked to the chairman the other day. And so they included in their response to the environmental impact statement on the uh, on the Snake uh, Lower Force, or the, it's actually the Com Columbia River Hydro System, something or a CSRO, they call it Columbia, Columbia River um, Operating System. 
And so um, we got, we're getting their support slowly but surely on this whole issue. And so what we wanted to do with the, um, how do I get rid of this? Are you trying to get rid of the share screen? Yeah. So you can uh, just at the bottom it says stop sharing. I can do it for you. Okay. Anyway, so um, with the rights of the rivers, it's, it's like other people have said with us. The main thing is like when we um, first started doing our, we do tribal environmental summits, had uh, people, speakers come and talk about various aspects of the, the timber, um, the uh, water, the fish, the salmon, the elk and, and the plants and you know everything living because we feel and I personally believe that um, the problem I see with um, the past and the current society is they come up, they make everything a commodity, you know, the timber, what is a commodity, the plants are a commodity, the water is a commodity, that, how much can we make off of this uh, water by damming it up and creating energy and, and doing things like that. And so, and then with what, whatever it is, you know, now, now we have, um, you know, I know a lot of people around here, college community really like this whitewater rafting. So they have a big whitewater rafting industry down in Riggins and, and kind of a middle fork by the Sam River. So everyone's all into that. You know, now they're selling boats, whitewater rafting and, and chores and stuff like that. And so to me, Elliot, my cousin I and, and Lucy are kind of our resident elder, uh, Nimiko elder, we talked about like, okay, even, even with non-Indian groups, we had this issue about like, why do we want to do this? Like, why, why do we want to get rid of these dams and, you know, it seemed like we had a varying ideas on like what was important, like what was the value of this, and and to me it's just like the value of roadless and wilderness area. That's it's an aesthetic value, and the similar with the fish, the salmon, and um, the rights of the rivers is to me it came down to I had a big issue before with okay, like if I go out and dig for our medicine for the sweat lodge you know, and, and their timber industry or a group's gonna come and cut all the wood in that area and kill all the plants that we use, the medicine. So what right do I have or what standing do I have to do even do anything about it? You know, I have a treaty right, but that comes down to the tribe representing me because that's who they assume has the treaty right as a tribe. And so then it started making us think about what rights do the rivers have? What right does this water have, this, this body, this entity, this being? that was put here for not just for us to exploit or to abuse or misuse or mistreat, but for us to use to survive, to live just like, and so we need the water just as much as the, the water needs us to protect it. And so that was the main gist of with our rights of rivers. And it's not just, a, it, we just started with the Snake River right now because that's the most critical one that is impacting the uh, tribe. And like um, Shannon was saying, the culture, you know, we haven't been able to, like right now we can't, we might be able to fish for some coho right now, but the, the salmon industry, the salmon for our treaty rights is so diminished now, it's almost going extinct. There's already some uh, salmon species runs that are on the endangered species list. And so the salmon, you know, if it doesn't, if they don't remove those dams or breach them, the salmon are gonna go extinct. So thereby goes our treaty rights. So that's really what we're fighting for with the rights of the rivers is to protect the river and to protect the salmon, to protect everything that lives in the river, whether it's lamprey or whatever. And so that's kind of what we're pushing right now. We're probably, compared to a lot of other groups, on the first step of getting that resolution through the Tribal General Council, and then we go, we're gonna meet with the Tribal Council about it to start pushing it. And so we wanna make sure that, um, like we work with a lot of kids during the regular school year, we should be starting work with, so we work with them on it, educating them on these types of ideas on environmental issue rights of rivers. And so we're just gonna continue pushing to get support through our tribe, through our tribal council to push. It's like I said, the main issues we have with our with federal agencies, Corps of Engineers, BLM, uh, Forest Service, because you know they have pressure too, which I understand, but we also have treaty rights and, and treaties, treaties are the law of the land. It's not just something that 
people think, oh, well, I don't know, the treaties, did they expire or aren't they gone? No, they're just as valid today. And so we're trying to make sure that through actions like the rights of the rivers that we took and we're working on that, we can protect that water, not only for the water itself, but for the future generations. So thanks a lot. I appreciate you. I really like to network with people and, and kind of coordinate our efforts because that's really what we need as uh, Indians, people, as Indian countries to coordinate our efforts because there's a lot of a lot of you know people against us and i've seen it and you know i i really like the idea of working together networking with other tribes or the tribal members to push for the issues and we support other you know first nations we um, support them up in the tar sands i know a lot of friends up there a lot of different people that we work with in the states here too and so we've worked on a lot of different campaigns with people and so i'm just uh, thankful for this opportunity and i appreciate everyone's uh, talk so far thanks Thank you so much, Julian. Um, it's exciting, the work that you're doing, and I look forward to uh, further conversation. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Casey Camp Hornick. Let me make sure she's, are you there, Casey? I can't see your face. There you are. <laughs> Casey Camp Hornick yes. is, uh, is a Ponca elder, a traditional drum keeper for the Women's Society and environmental ambassador of the Ponca tribe of Oklahoma, among many things uh, on, her, on her list of to-dos. She's a mother, a grandmother, uh, and while serving on the Ponca Business Council, she led her tribe to become the first to pass a statute recognizing the rights of nature and the rights of climate on Ponca lands. She is also the indigenous hub leader for the Global Alliance for the rights of nature. We're honored to say she's also a movement rights board chair and along with Penny Opal Plant leads our intertribal rights of nature forums, which uh, we'll be talking about. Uh, Casey and Penny will both be talking a little bit about those. Uh, where the growing number of tribes interested and co tribal communities interested in rights of nature can have frank discussions among themselves about rights of nature as a way forward for their communities. Casey, I hand the floor to you. Please share with us your experience with rights of nature and rights of uh, climate statute, the iron forms, and uh, as you know, anything else that you are feeling called to, to speak about today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mashte Panka, Oklahoma. Lahe Tamajik de Tinike Ganke Giza de Ati. I wanted to greet you as a Panka woman. Uh, my traditional name is Judy. I'm a, a Southern Panka living here in Oklahoma after a forced removal when my grandpa was eight years old. I, Part of our people are here in this, uh, imprisoned in this redneck state called Oklahoma. I'm really uh, grateful to listen to you and to learn from you. Uh, my relative, uh, Dion, I'm always grateful to see you. And, and it's, uh, it's wonderful to see my girls here and to listen to the wisdom of the young woman uh, and and to the Nez Pierce gentlemen. I believe that uh, the Nez Pierce were also signed on to the Treaty Alliance some years ago uh, to stop KXL. Uh, were you part of that group? Yeah. Yes. Anyway, it's wonderful to listen and to learn. And uh, I'm very grateful to share a bit with you. Some years back, you know, I learned from uh, Shannon at a, at a group we were at in uh, New York, a group of 100 women coming together, trying to understand what we could do at this uh, critical moment in history, where there's a, a good chance that humans will erase themselves from the face of our mother, uh, unless we coordinated among ourselves how to go forward in a respectful way, how to realign 
uh, ourselves with the natural laws, how to look at indigenous wisdom and see how it's applicable today. And uh, there's, there's nothing but every way that it works today. So Shannon spoke to me at that time about this thing called rights of nature and the law around it. And I immediately bristled. I come from a generation of uh, the people who had all of these laws imposed upon us, you know. My mother, being the first generation born in captivity, uh, on a POW camp called a reservation. Prior to that, our people lived those natural laws and understood how all things are connected and, and those things that, that we all know here on this panel. And when I heard about this rights of nature and the thoughts of putting it into a legal framework, I immediately went to uh, this Freedom of Religion Act and I remember my brother Carter Camp saying any time they make a law about something that is a natural law that already belongs to us by virtue of the great mystery, then we have a fence around us. Then they're telling us how we should even pray. And so a law around rights of nature to me had those same implications. And it took me many years of looking around, of seeing how other indigenous peoples viewed this before I could even uh, consider the idea of what it could mean on the Ponca Reservation and Ponca Territory, both Northern and Southern. And what I came to understand is that this already is in existence, this rights of nature. And, and as we spoke of uh, earlier, you know, we're not just protecting nature, we're nature protecting itself. So how do we put that into the system of our own sovereignty that says not only do we recognize this thing you all call human uh, rights that you're already breaking, how do we recognize it within treaty law that you've already abrogated? How do we recognize it within the uh, Environmental Protection Agency that has its, uh, its roots already trying to grow within our tribal systems under our environmental offices? But coming from our own viewpoint, coming from a Ponca viewpoint, and so we, we began talking more and more about it and, and holding small community gatherings and visiting among ourselves here at home and abroad to see how this made sense in our territory where we have uh, fracking and injection wells that are causing 10,000 earthquakes up to a 5.8 in magnitude, where we have networks like, like spider webs underneath the earth of pipelines coming through here where we have Phillips 66 refinery and, and, and tank batteries that's poisoning air, water, and earth, and consequently the Ponca people and the two rivers that we live close to. What is it that we have in our toolkit that is separate from the federal agencies imposing their will on us? Well, that looked like the rights of nature. That looked like an immutable law that had already been in existence for time immemorial. Something that was the way that our grandparents and great grandparents and generations before followed without having to be told. And so, working with a, an attorney that uh, kind of understood how to put it into a legal uh, base where it could be utilized from there. And working with Penny and Shannon coming to our uh, territory and we would talk to our business committee 
and I happened to be sitting on it at that time. Um, we brought forth this statute. We had done a few iron forms. I don't know if that was before or after uh, in a tribal rights of nature forms where we were listening to other indigenous people, including Dion about uh, how they were going forth in their territory, because this is a very individual approach that we all need to look at. Because the great mystery put us into particular areas on Mother Earth. And so this is the area that you get to caretake. It is your sacred honor and duty to be a part of that system of life that exists there. How you do that, is, is brought to you through prayer, through recognizing that those rivers around you, that those springs and aquifers, that those thunders and rain are, are their own individual personality and beings. And the water, when she speaks, she has a voice. She has an intention. She has a love for us, just like our mother, the earth does. Unconditional love, unconditional life that flows through her and then through us and through all other living beings. The breath that we share the same way. The trees, they have the same waters and their dews drop down and grow the plants underneath them and those come in us. It is such a beautiful system and it's already there. So what do we do as human beings but come into alignment with that? And we're just beginning, we're just scratching the surface. But I, it seems to me, just like in the Ponca territory, when, we first, when I first came into office, we introduced a resolution that was to put a moratorium on fracking and injection wells. And that was to say to the Bureau of Indian Affairs, who are kind of like, feel like they have power of attorney over our entire existence to say to the federal government we have this in place now it is our law you now have to challenge us we no longer are going to feel comfortable within the parameters of your ignorance you have not done anything to engender life itself within our indigenous peoples within the ponca nation within the entire system of life. So here we are, we're gonna put this forth to you now. And you need to start looking at how these are formed. You know, going into the United Nations with the uh, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of uh, Indigenous Peoples has many of these things within its parameters. But we wanna continue to push this a little further so that they begin to not be a square circle of linear events, but a round circle in response to what's going on in that particular prayer moment. Just like today is the equinox. Today is a day of balance. This is us as humans trying to come back into balance, trying to erase and arise the patriarchal system of, of, of mistakes that has happened before and bring into the matriarchal understanding of understanding the nurturing and unconditional love of all living beings for each other and all beings are living. So it's a very important moment for us in this time of COVID. I feel like that's that we're having to, we're being uh, forced to reassess and realign, go into our homes and stay there, not be traveling all over, but use this form of communication. Uh, I, you know, my mom was, was of a understanding of these things already. I remember when we were young and all the way till now, when we came to the river, or the ocean if we travel to visit, or a stream nearby, or even to go get water from the well. My mother had us put our, our hands in that water to begin with. She said, so the water will know you. 
She knew that the water had her own ways. She knew that if we showed our intention by placing our hands in the water, that the water would take care of us. And so there are, are all of the indigenous traditional ways of being that we need to bring into these understandings so that those who have forgotten their ways, those who are intent on polluting, on damming, on putting things into a box and then presenting them back to the indigenous people, have a barrier so that they have to understand that there is another way of being and that our intent, if they help us to uphold the indigenous ways, is to also protect them. Because maybe they forgot that seventh generation philosophy, but we haven't, many of us. Many of us who understand the colonizers' words, understand their laws, understand their uh, thought pattern of when they came onto these lands, to, not, to look at our sources of life and put a word on it called resource. These are not resources to us. These are sources of life itself. And so this rights of nature and the intertribal rights of nature forum can happen in a way that, that we begin to share with all of our human relatives through these common voices that we're bringing in, different approaches from different portions of the earth have relevance in creating laws and policies. And I thank you very much. I hope we have some questions and it's wonderful to be here and learn from all of you. We, uh -huh. Sean. Hi, um, thank you, Casey, as always. Um, your words are so powerful and the work that you've done um, is, is we're, we're just very honored to be connected and connected with all of you and the powerful work that you're all doing. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Penny Opal Plant, um, who is the co-founder of Movement Rights as well as the co-founder of Idle No More SF Bay and many other uh, groups and um, her work over the decades um, has, uh, you know, really been, uh, has, has really shifted things, everything from nuclear energy to climate change uh, and, has, and particularly in the Bay Area where she lives. So um, Penny, I wanna thank you for, um, for all of your, <laughs> all of your work that we do together and everything that else that you do um, in, in life. And I'm hoping that you'll just discuss a little bit about uh, movement rights work as part of this uh, rights of nature and working with um, tribes and indigenous communities. Um, I'll put up a screen for some of those, uh, the Iron Forum and other trainings so people can get a, a little bit more of a, of a sense of that. And also one of the questions we were asked is uh, how you can help. And of course, we'll put up uh, our donation page. Any donations that we receive through Movement Rights for this month will move directly. We'll, uh, 100% of those proceeds will uh, be put forward to our intertribal rights of nature work with other tribes who are looking at this work and um, and providing assistance and connection and sharing and co-learning as as best we can so thank you penny for taking uh for for taking us through the the last bit of our webinar today before we open to questions great thanks so much shannon and thank you panelists uh, Dion, Kelsey, Julian, and always Casey, you know, you have a big place that you occupy in my heart. <laughs> so I, it was wonderful to learn uh, things about rights of nature and what you all are doing within your own tribal nations and areas. It's very inspiring uh, for Shannon and I to, to be able to listen to you. 
you know, uh, for two women essentially working around a kitchen table over the last six years, um, we're surprised and grateful and, you know, about how much that we've been able to get done. And it's a testament to the power of women working together and having uh, an idea of what's important at this time to you know, ensure that there is a safe, sustainable, healthy, vibrant future for all the babies to come past the seventh generation. Uh, we're, we're in this critical, critical time where um, it, and I know we've all heard this many times, uh, that it's really up to us and the people alive on Mother Earth's belly right now as to how things are going to move forward. And I like to remind people that these systems of destruction that, uh, that are here right now, that are destroying the very essence of what we need to simply exist are new. Humans have been around and are present form for a very, very long time, hundreds of thousands of years at the very least. And these systems of capitalism and laws that allow the harms and decision makers that promote those harms, they're very new, a, a couple hundred years at the most. So I'd like to remind people of that because this isn't just set in cement, it's very malleable. And the work that Movement Rights does is, um, you know, just one part of this huge movement around the world to recognize the rights of Mother Earth, because obviously she has rights. And at this point, I think we all know that those rights have been violated. And so here we are on this beautiful autumn equinox day, um, listening to these wise and courageous and intelligent people that I'm so happy to be on this panel on. And um, I've been thinking all, all day since I woke up about a quote uh, from Sitting Bull that seems real, very applicable to what we're talking about today. And he said, as an individual, as individual fingers, of course my page fell, as individual fingers, um, there it is. As individual fingers, we can easily be broken, but all together we make a mighty fist. And not that that's a fist to harm anything, but it's sometimes we raise our hands to bring us more power and more authority and know that all of those fingers are connected to people that are doing the exact same thing around the world, not just on Turtle Island. It's inspiring to see the number of people just like all of us who are doing this work and have been doing it now for quite a while but who are joining this important movement and so within this work one of the things that shannon and casey and i have recognized is that one of the most important things is shifting culture in whatever community that is, if it's a tribal nation or the community where you live or, you know, talking to any people that are decision makers, how important it is to help people understand everything that you have listened to today on this webinar. And I think that this webinar has given everyone the, the bones of where and how to move forward in learning how to talk about this with your friends and your relatives and the decision makers where you live. I think for, for indigenous people on Turtle Island, um, one of the things that we recognize is how important it is for within a certain geographic area, just like what Dion Ben is doing with the, the tribes, those 12 tribes on the Colorado Plateau, how important it is for tribal nations within a geographic area to, to look at these, um, to look at recognizing the rights of nature together. So that as these laws are passed within tribal nations, that if the federal government wants to move forward with anything trying to diminish these laws, which you know we all know that they have a history of doing that, that we would like that fist standing together, asserting sovereignty, because we have to assert the sovereignty wherever we are. 
Like we have, if it's important to embody that sovereignty, have it be part of your cellular structure. Like this is what we're doing because this is what we are born to do at this time. And so those are the, a couple of the things that I feel are very, very important. The talking to other people, learning how to talk to other people, learning how to, how to shift the culture so that we're on the same page with people. And once a, a good percentage of people understand what we're talking about, why this is the best way forward to preserving and ensuring the sacred system of life continues in a good way in perpetuity, then, then it's going to be much easier for this to spread out like beautiful waves of water who will continue to tell the story where, wherever these conversations flow. So one of the things that, that Movement Rights did a couple of years ago was we organized a groundbreaking conference uh, bringing primarily indigenous people and some of our allies together for a, a conference called the uh, Frontline o Oil and Gas Conference that w Casey Kemp Hornick and the Ponca Nation hosted uh, for all of us. And it was amazing and beautiful to talk to other people from Alaska, you know, all through Canada and the United States on these type of things that we're talking about. The Iron Forum um, is another aspect of what we do. And we bring indigenous people, tribal leaders together so that we can have these type of important conversations that, that sharing this information. And so if you're a tribal member and you're on this webinar, please contact us um, about organizing a, a, a Indigenous Rights of Nature Forum where you are. If you're not an Indigenous person and this is powerful information for you, then do some research on your own. Contact us. Um, we, we do occasional trainings for non-Indigenous people, especially if there's a real interest and commitment to working forward with these types of uh, laws and shifting the culture where you live. And so I thank you all. I think that was all I was to do right now. I'm, I'm really happy uh, to see all of, all of you and to be here with you at this time on this day of balance. Thank you. Thank you, Penny. Um, we do have several questions. Um, we're trying to keep on track at, at stopping at, at 1230 and have a closing. A prayer from Casey. So um, some of these, I'm, I'm gonna, some of them are directed at specific panelists, but quickly Heidi asks um, how companies can get away with manipulating local and national policies and laws so that especially diverse and indigenous peoples who are actually living at the source of the energy product project are not considered in the decision-making process of approving such a project? Well, that is a huge question. Um, Penny and I have uh, for 15 years now, some uh, long time, we actually done weekend trainings on this topic. Um, and it is included um, as, and we have some information on reports, but essentially one of the things to note that in Western law, almost everywhere, including the United States uh, and enshrined in the constitution, um, is the idea that nature is property. And um, I think that's the key point and the, the key difference with rights of nature. Um, rights of nature is not just about uh, recognizing that, um, that, that human rights derive from the source of life um, and the system of life, uh, but that with rights come responsibilities and we have human responsibilities to mother earth. Um, and our, you know, our sort of slogan for movement rights is aligning human laws with the, the laws of the natural world. And that's how we see the work that we do. The, the long answer to your question can be found by visiting our, our website. We have a number of resources available that you can read through. Uh, as well as the trainings that we offer um, that can sort of explain exactly how that happened because I think it's a really good important question to understand exactly 
um, how this government was formed, not just on stolen land, but also um, by people that were uh, an economy uh, by people who were stolen as well. So, um, so, so the answer to that is, is greater than we have time for today. Um, but that, that's the short answer. Um, Misty Babineau um, asks if there, are, there is a group of people organizing for the rights of the Mississippi River here in Minnesota. Would any of the panelists be willing to talk to and share knowledge or experience directly? So I offer that up to the panel. Is there anybody who would like to provide an answer to that question or thoughts? This is Kelsey. I would just say um, to first maybe look and see if there, I, I couldn't gather from the question if maybe they're already working with other indigenous nations in the region as well as other indigenous organizations in the region. Um, if, if, if they haven't sort of done a bit of um, exploration, there are some fantastic organizations already working in the region, uh, indigenous orgs. Uh, there's a youth organization um, called Minikiwaka that's based out of Minneapolis uh, that was founded by the LaPointe brothers. Um, it's a youth organization for advocating for uh, water rights uh, through an indigenous perspective globally. So they might be a great resource. I'd also say too that uh, the Nibaywaks that was founded by Sharon Day and it's the, uh, the grandmother uh, water walkers that are out of uh, Minneapolis and the surrounding area might be great points. And there's quite a few uh, tribal nations in that region too that may be of interest. So um, I would point them there first. Thanks. Um, in addition to that, uh, you're welcome to email me directly, Shannon, at movementrights.org and uh, I, I may have a few contacts that are already working in that area, but I, I think I take Kelsey Leonard's um, um, point um, very much it, uh, making sure that if that this is something that starts and is centered around in indigenous communities, that's a really critical piece. So thank you for your question. Um, so Rick Bertholds, Berth, Berkholds uh, asked simply if the presentation that you gave Julian, uh, the, the PowerPoint, if you would make that available publicly, uh, if that's something that you'd like to share, we can, um, we can share it out uh, as part of our response to all attendees, uh, or, or if that's something that, that you that you care to share. Sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that'd be fine. That's what I was going to suggest that I could go ahead uh, to spend some time on it. <laughs> on the tribes die, our tribes die. Sure. Thank you. It would be great. That's it was very rich information, and we'd be happy to share that out. So I was thinking if if you're talking about Minnesota, I think Winona LaDuke runs that White Earth Foundation. I could. I, she said the Mississippi River. Was she talking the Mississippi River in Minnesota? The one question about. Uh, I'm trying to get back up there. I I can't. Uh, I can't see it anymore. Oh. Well. Well. Anyway, if if it's in Minnesota, I know Winona the Duke runs that uh, White Earth. I think it's foundation or they deal a lot with the uh, rice and water. I think, I don't know if they, she might have some connections with the, that river if it's in Minnesota. Um, yes, in fact, the uh, White Earth is um, one of the other communities that have recognized rights of nature um, through the rights of Manuman rice. So um, that is, so the part of this growing movement. So I think that would be an excellent suggestion. Thank you for that. Um, we are really out of time. Uh, I know there are a few other questions um, and uh, we'll try to follow up and answer them uh, on email and, and share those questions without sharing people's names. Um, some, some people have 
requested not to share names. So we will um, indeed be sharing <laughs> and sharing any answers to questions in a follow-up email. Um, I want to thank all of the panelists. Your work is so inspiring and this has been so, so rich and informative for the work that Movement Rights is doing. And um, I, I think part of what we see is the indigenous leadership of rights of nature and what that, uh, and, and what that looks like. And it doesn't look like one thing. Uh, and so this was a beautiful way to really share and express the, the, the different ways in which this, this body of work comes together. And Casey, if I could turn it over to you to ask you to give us, to close us out with a prayer. Thank you. Thank you. I keep uh, seeing on the, the comments here, this uh, lady named Heidi, who's having a birthday today. So I just have to say happy birthday, Heidi, first and foremost. Um, I want to thank you, each and every one, for your good words, your, your good thoughts, and your good ways, you know, and for my young relative, Dion, to have opened, you know, got a beautiful heart and spirit, and it, I, I could feel him from, from the other webinar I was on. Thank you. My daughter and I, my eldest daughter and I, had an EUP ceremony yesterday. Um, sweat Lodge ceremony. And we knew that today is the equinox, but in the way of our people, we always have a closing ceremony as well. If we have a dinner, if we have a whatever ceremony, then there's also that moment where you let things go. And for us yesterday, it was a moment to let summer of 2020 be dismissed. It's been a learning time. It's been <clears throat> a time that we've sat at home and shared with one another. Uh, it's been a learning time for me how to use these computers in order to connect with others. It's been a learning time on how to mourn without spending four days with our relatives who are moving on. It's been a learning time about the fires and their purification process. It's, it's sad to watch the humans leaving and the four legs, the fins, the wings, and those that burrow, and how they're being affected by the fires, by the hurricanes, by the encroachment of human beings into their territory. It's been sad to see the sacred waters being dammed up and the salmon having to suffer and in consequence, humans having to suffer. So I'm just gonna say a, a short word of closing here that encompasses some of those uh, dismissals of that time and moving forward into the next. Thank you for allowing me. Wakanda Khobe. Maja Hube, Weblaha Ehe, Weblaha Ne Miaba, Ne Dakte Debia, Woy Sa De Ne Neba Wahube, Yupi. Wanna say thank you. Creator, Earth Mother, for all those things that are the natural ways, the sun, the moon, the waters, the four legs, the wings, all those other things we named and think of within the territories that we inhabit with them. We ask as we go forward that that door behind us close gently on this time that we are sharing in this moment of history where this thing they call a pandemic has us in our homes, learning and teaching. We wanna say a blessing for the sacred corn 
and all of her relatives. We want to say a blessing on all of those things that we call food that grows us cell by cell. On the sacred breath, these winds that blow around the earth, the thunder nation. On the fire that warms our bodies from our Father's Son, that it maybe can take a rest from its purification. For the sacred rains that are rebalancing this thing called climate and for climate itself as it heals. We ask that the healing continue to be accelerated in mind, body, spirit, emotions, and intentions. And that as we closed that door yesterday, that this new door of balance present a way forward that humans might continue into this harmonious way that the great mystery set in place for all these things and anything forgotten, including those mourners. We ask you to look inside our hearts and spirits and bring them out through the sacred pipe, through every sacred way that we all talk to you, great mystery, Earth Mother. We offer this prayer. Sha, we're dismissed. Thank you everybody for joining us today. And we look forward to continuing the conversation. Blessings to all of our speakers, much gratitude and have a wonderful day. Thank you.